First and foremost, parenting, really great parenting, requires what Joanne was talking about is recognizing the, your child's developmental stage. What are they capable of doing at what's, what age? And number two, truly recognizing their deficits and their assets. So that if there is a deficit, again, Joanne mentioned dyslexia, you are going to do everything you can to remediate it, to make it less. And if they have assets, you're gonna do everything possible to enhance it. And the overriding theme that you've been hearing again and again is that you have to spend time and effort and you have to say no. I mean, those were the three messages that each person is telling you. And unfortunately, uh, television and videos and iPhones and screens are just not any way, first of all, they turn out to not only be a sub, not a substitute, they turn out to sometimes be detrimental. Uh, Patricia Cull, who Joanne just mentioned as the professor from Seattle, uh, she actually was the person who got people to start a class action against Baby Einstein, and Baby Einstein was actually required to return money to anybody who showed them a receipt because it was truly false advertising. The other piece that you should remember is that if you ever try to teach your kid a foreign language by putting them in front of a screen where people are only speaking a, another language, they literally do not learn. They, if you have someone in the house, a grandmother, a nanny, a spouse who only speaks French or Spanish or Arabic or Hebrew to that child, the child will recognize that they can only respond in that language and will learn two languages at the same time. So time, effort, and saying no. Um, Full disclosure, I'm not going to take my jacket off um, <laughs> because I'm not 65 yet, no. Um, and I am a New York City parent, so I raised, my wife and I raised three kids here in New York, and I always like to say that uh, being a parent is the hardest and clearly the most uh, challenging but yet rewarding job in the world. In New York City, I think it's always a little bit more difficult. In 1996, um, I wrote my first book called It's Nobody's Fault, New Hope and Help for Difficult Children and Their Parents. Uh, it was basically a book that said psychiatric disorders were not caused by your mom or dad. It wasn't your mom uh, not suckling you enough or, or being too harsh in the way she wiped your rear end. Or those were not the things that caused you to get obsessive compulsive disorder or depression, et cetera. I did get colleagues, I want you to know, who wrote to me saying, what do you mean mothers clearly cause depression. And I said, no, your mother can be depressing, but she doesn't give you depression. And this was only around 20 years after the time where we used to believe that mothers could cause schizophrenia. That a mother that gave you a mixed message could actually um, make you start hallucinating and seeing things and hearing voices. So not only did you get a child, this, this is different than the autistic moms. We believed autism was caused by moms too. Those were the moms that just didn't pick their children up enough and didn't hold them enough. And, and you laugh, but not only were you told that you would have a child that wasn't gonna be able to speak or wasn't gonna be able to be independent, but was caused by your mother, not by you not picking up the child. So schizophrenogenic mothers were pretty well known. And the fact that I wrote this book that said, it's nobody's fault. I was actually on um, Oprah, and I got 52 minutes of Oprah, me and Oprah, sitting on the you know, two leather chairs, talking about the book. This is pre-Amazon days, so we sold 10,000 copies of the book in 24 hours, but I can't imagine what we could have sold now that people are just buying books online. And uh, my mother was alive at the time. She was a psychiatric social worker. She didn't watch daytime television. Um, I, you know, she was working. And I sent her one of those big videotapes. There's too many young people here, but used to tape the uh, videotape you would get. It was very large. And I sent it to my mom on Long Island. And about a week, two weeks later, my mother calls me up and says, by the way, you were really impressive. You're so articulate, and you have so much stage presence, and your fund of knowledge is terrific. And, and that African-American woman did very well, too. And um, <laughs> may she rest in peace. This is absolutely true. And then she said to me, but where did you get that suit? Now, that's a mixed message. You know? And of course, they said, Bloomingdale's, Armani, whatever, Barney's. And my mother said, Brown, it's just not a good color for you. Now, it's annoying, but it doesn't cause schizophrenia. And, <laughs> and, neither, and neither does, 
you know, not picking up your child enough cause autism, or toileting them the wrong way cause OCD, and, and we're going to go through some of the other real anxiety disorders. Um, but going back to why it's difficult to parent. So I get this book. Uh, Ned Hallowell had written Driven to Distraction one year before. Every literary publicist said the thing you have to do is get on Good Morning America and have, um, I'm blocking on her first name, London at the time. Uh, Joan, thank you. She was, Kate, forget Katie Couric, it was Joan. And Joan had to interview and she would give you a bestseller just like Ned Hallowell's bestseller. And so I get booked on the show uh, from seven to eight and the last minute I get bumped to the eight to nine o'clock hour, which is not when you, you know, no one wants that because no one's at home. And um, the late Itzhak Rabin's granddaughter bumped me for a memoir about her grandfather and she sold less books than I did, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but nevertheless, I now am stuck. But there was a silver lining. The silver lining for me was that I was working at the time. I was the head of child psychiatry at Long Island Jewish and we lived in Manhattan. So I had a reverse commute and I never got to walk the kids to school. And so I got to walk my youngest son who was six and we're walking down the street and two, two big boys who are eight years old are having a very animated discussion in front of us. And one says to the other, you'll never guess what I found this weekend. And the second boy says, what? And he said, I found a condom on the patio. And the second boy said, really? What's a patio? So <laughs> parents in New York, it's just a little bit more difficult, okay? So the let's talk about Let's talk about why anxiety is normal, why it's good, and Joanne just told us about the amygdala, and the amygdala is essential. We have this part of our brain that actually we show in animal models. The amygdala, t basically, you feel anxiety, you feel scared before you know it. So in other words, before there is the recognition that there is a bad man or a bad woman with a gun in the room that's going to hurt us, we sense it in some ways that something has changed in the environment. The best examples are mice. Sensing, you can do these images on their brain, sensing that there is a cat in their vicinity before the frontal lobes where they can really know and see the cat and so they start running beforehand. So the next time you're walking down a street and it, it's dark and it's cold and you're not sure if there's a doorman in the next building and you hear some rustling, there's a sense that there might be danger before there really is danger. So the amygdala keeps us safe. It's when our amygdala or our parts of our brain basically tell us to worry and to be scared when there's nothing to worry about. And that's when it causes distress and it causes dysfunction. And for our children, this is particularly worrisome because anxiety that goes out of control, that becomes an anxiety disorder, is not only bad because you're going to be upstairs, you know, if you're at the nursery school up here for days, weeks, or months waiting outside the room of the classroom because your child's so separation anxious, it's also bad for the child's brain. The actual activity of anxiety turns out to be toxic to the brain. It actually primes the brain for other bad stuff down the, the road. And so I'm not saying you have to jump in and do something immediately, but it's the difference between recognizing what is normal anxiety and when it becomes a pathological state. So let's go back to, anyone have newborns here? Anyone have, okay. So this wonderful time when the baby's around six months old, seven months old, and um, you hand the baby off to somebody else and the baby looks up into that other person's face and starts to cry. And what has happened is the baby gets stranger anxiety. The baby can actually recognize the difference between your face and the face of a stranger. Um, and you know, it happens all the time in the pediatrician's office. I actually did pediatrics before I did psychiatry and then general psychiatry, that a baby would be handed to you. The baby, you know, you start looking at the baby, the baby gets a good look at your face, and you could be the best looking pediatrician. The, it doesn't make a difference, the baby just starts to cry. And that's actually a good anxiety. We like that because it, now something is cooking in the brain and connecting and they can tell the difference. Sometimes babies don't have separation anxiety. Now there are, you know, neglect causes that, visual problems, auditory problems will cause the fact that the baby can't pick this up, but also sometimes multiple caretakers 
having grandma, multiple nannies, multiple, uh, multiple caretakers taking care of the kids. So if you think of it as almost a computer, the child gets put into your arm, looks up, looks into the face, and before he cries at the pediatrician, he said, well, this is not my mother, this is not my father, this is not nanny number one, this is not nanny number two, this is not grandma. And by the time he's gone through all the slides, maybe the pediatrician looks a little bit like Aunt Rose or Uncle Pete or whatever. <laughs> so they don't have that. But by and large, your pediatrician is looking for that separation, for that stranger anxiety. It's when that becomes a pathological state, not the absence, but the presence of it, is that when we really start to worry. So a kid will go to school, but will not speak or will not answer questions. Or the child will be so hesitant before they go to a birthday party. And it might be the clown, but it also just might be the whole social situation. And sometimes children who are four years old or five years old can verbalize it. They can't say, I'm uncomfortable. But if you want to recognize what they're feeling, think about the last time you went to a cocktail party with your significant other for their business. You know what I mean? It was lawyers, and you're not a lawyer. And you walk into the room and you say, I can't believe how much I dis just despise lawyers, you know, or, or I'm dressed the wrong way, or who am I going to talk to? That's the typical question that most people go into a cocktail party and say, who am I going to talk to? They don't say, or worse still, who will even talk to me? Do you mean that's the real killer? Because if I pick one or two people and they don't talk to me, it's really awful. So one of the things that we worry about is this pathologically anxious state. We are self-conscious. And what do we do? We go to the bar. We have a drink. Hopefully we meet someone who's just as uncomfortable as us at the bar, and we start to chat. The problem with that treatment, by the way, is that the next time you're going to need two drinks or three drinks, it doesn't really work if you're chronically pathologically self-conscious. And what we want to do is we want to try to work with kids before there's anxiety. So we teach our kids lots of things. We teach our kids to say please and thank you, you're welcome. We tell them how to shake, and some of us forget to tell our children how to shake hands. So I, my oldest son was always one of those anxious kids. In fact, um, you know, he was comfortable in silence. So we used to talk about how do you shake hands, that whether you're a girl or a boy, the way to shake hands, it's a puzzle. This piece goes into this piece, and you have to hold on to the hand long enough uh, that you are staring into the person's eye, and you have to be able to tell, the, tell your parents later on what color their eye was, so that you were really looking them in the eye. Uh, you know, this is what happens when you're a child psychiatrist and you're making things up as you go along instead of reading a book. So I tell this to my son, and um, He's uh, five years old at the time. He, we're at an event in Central Park. At the time, the commissioner of parks was this very uh, quirky guy named Henry Stern. And he comes bouncing into this event. And he sees me and says, oh, my wife knows you. You're a child psychiatrist. I'd like to meet your kid. And he comes over, and he meets Josh who's five years old at the time, and he says to Joshua, uh, I'm the commissioner of parks, and Joshua knows about you questions. Because again, if you want to make someone to feel, how many times have you gotten stuck at a dinner party where the man to your left and right doesn't know about you questions? They just sit there. You questions are, where did you go to school? Do you have children? How do you know the host? Where did you get that beautiful sweater? People love to talk about themselves. If you have a guy sitting between the two women, which I've seen more often than a woman sitting between, you know, between a guy sitting between, uh, besides the men don't know how to talk, but the women always know how to talk, you say, you know, they tell me about yourself. So Joshua knows about you questions. He asks the commissioner, well, what do you do as commissioner of parks? And he says, oh, I make sure the grass is green here in Central Park, and the ponds are filled with water, and the horses are fed. And so Joshua doesn't get the joke, you know, kind of goes over his head. And he says, oh, that sounds interesting. How do you get a job like that? And Henry Stern says, well, where do you go to school? And Joshua tells him. And he says, well, you should go back to school tomorrow and look around your classroom and figure out which person's going to become mayor someday. And then you can get a job like this. Goes right over his head again, too. <laughs> And then Henry goes over and shakes hen hands with Joshua, and Joshua grabs hold of his hand, and he goes so close to his face to check his eye color that it's almost like an ophthalmological examination. You know, he's like, 
And, you know, and, and Henry seems oblivious, walks away, and my wife leans over to me and says, I think we need a little more rehearsal here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's those kinds of things that if you, now, I have three sons. My third son could teach me how to shake hands and how to look you in the eye and how to talk to someone because in the same way that we talk about certain, you know, the, the spelling uh, muscle just didn't, the Koplowitzes and the Ciro's never got that. So we thank God for spell check. The, uh, we were not the spelling champions of New York State. But when it came to Sam, here's a guy who naturally got that. So he doesn't need that. that deficit he doesn't have, but it's spending time with the child who does have the deficit to teach them the handshake and the three you questions. What happens if the kid really goes overboard with this? That the, the intensity of the anxiety is such, it's so painful that they literally will talk to mom and dad, and they will be chatterboxes in their house, and yet outside of their house they will not speak. And this is known as selective mutism. It is actually very common. It's 1% of the childhood population. Uh, these kids suffer tremendously. Um, they literally will not raise their hand because it feels like a spotlight on them, and therefore they're even more intensely self-conscious. They will sometimes hold their urine in all day long so that they won't go to the bathroom and they'll develop uh, urinary tract infections, or they'll urinate on themselves not to ask to go to the, to the to, for permission to go to the bathroom. And the experience that the teacher has of them is not that this is a poor, shy little child. They will feel that this is an oppositional child because I said good morning and you don't even do that. You turn your head away from me and you know, I saw you whispering to your little friend because there might be one friend you're talking to. So I see it as oppositional and defiant uh, and spoiled, which, uh, by the way, I, no matter what you do, you cannot spoil your child. Okay? It's not a piece of meat or lox or fish or cheese. You know, you can, you can make errors, we can correct the errors, but you don't spoil someone. I mean, this is, you know, kids will do things because of the way they feel, uh, not because someone has ruined them. Um, but you can understand how over time the child will now want to avoid school. The amazing part is that there are treatments for this, and the treatments um, are not what you would think. So, what, uh, you know, Joanne talked about enabling in some ways, hugging the monster. Well, I talk about it as feeding the monster, so that you make the selective mutism, or you make the separation anxiety, or you make the obsessive compulsive disorder so much stronger when you give into it. And you can't give into it, but at the same time, you have to be supportive. So a child who has selective mutism, we have found that using behavioral therapy in a program that we've developed actually at the Child Mind Institute called Brave Buddies actually works. We rent the 92nd Street Y Nursery School when they're on vacation, and we have 25 kids who have selective mutism, and we keep them there for a full class day in a simulated classroom setting, and they are reinforced for eventually speaking. Do you mean they nod their heads, they get two stars, they get to point yes or no, they, they can get another two stars. By the end of the week, we had Juju Chang from Nightline follow them for five days, two summers ago when we did this, and she said she couldn't believe what was happening to these children, and at the end, they were saying hello to strangers in Central Park, which she questioned if that was a good outcome or not, <laughs> but they were fake strangers. You know, they were, but the, the idea of it is treatment in vivo. In other words, instead of just chatting to me, where you'll eventually develop a warm, satisfying relationship with me like you do with your parents, it'll never generalize. So literally, we have fake Halloween a week before Halloween at the Child Mind Institute. So we have kids running around quietly or silently, and they have to say the words trick or treat before they can get the candy that they want. And it is kind of amazing how people can be patient and just stand there and keep waiting and saying, hi, how are you, but not giving in and just handing over the candy. And if the kid can't do it, then they say, well, the person who's next to them, the brave buddy who's next to them, say, let's try the next person. And beforehand, they will give them a, a little bit more of an intervention so that they're more successful to the next person that they have to do that. But selective mutism, le selective mutism left untreated doesn't get better. So you can imagine how um, contained and encapsulated a person's life is when they literally can't speak. And you know what happens, mom and dad start speaking for them. They literally, eight, nine years old, they'll say, oh, 
he's very happy right now. And the whole family starts to read into or listen to the whisper. And it's not an entitlement. They're not treating the kid because the kid's spoiled. They just feel so sorry for the child. And the anxiety just keeps getting bigger and bigger. The, they have the highest rate, selective mutism, kids with selective mutism have the highest rate of alcohol use in adolescents than any other set of kids. So it's not the bad boys who become drinkers. It's actually the very, very selectively mutism and very socially anxious boys and girls that become drinkers. The, the next thing that we remember is just what I was talking about, separation anxiety. So all of us have taken our kids to nursery school where they're not ready to do it, or they don't want to sleep in their own bed at nighttime, and they, they're calling out to you, or they're visiting you every night, um, or <coughs> they can't make it through a night at someone else's house. So separation anxiety is actually a common phenomenon. And if you can remember, for some of you, it's happening right now, when you go to Central Park with your kids, and you're sitting there on the bench, and your child at two years of age goes off and plays with some other kids within your eyesight, and then for no apparent reason stops playing, comes back, touches your leg, or asks for a cookie, or just seems to need to be refueled in some way, and then goes back out again. Uh, they're they're really working through separation anxiety. And, and we've created a relatively artificial um, system here because we send our kids to school at two and a quarter, two and a half, and some of them are just not ready uh, neurologically or psychologically to separate from a parent or a caretaker for two hours or four hours, and they need to be transitioned. Unfortunately, the way we work it, though, is we do, we, we get, take kids into school and we say, oh, this first day of school is 10 minutes and the next day of school is 20 minutes, which it, it's kind of like going up into a, you know, if you're afraid of flying, the worst flights are the shuttles to um, Boston or Washington, because essentially your locus aureus can keep firing for 45 minutes. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And the flight to Washington is you get, you're on the plane, you go up in the air, and just when the locus aurelius is just exhausted, there's no more, there's just no more neurochemical, you're landing, <laughs> which it's worthless. It doesn't tr teach you to, to the lack of fear of flying. And that's the same thing with the five minutes of school, the 10 minutes of school, 15 minutes. It's so much easier almost to just send them to school and let the school try to distract them, which is the number one thing, get them involved with someone else. And then number two, console them, but reinforce the fact that they're succeeding while they're away from parents. And, and the, it, when you think about it, the worst thing for a kid is have you ever broken up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and they lived in the same building as you, or they lived in the same dorm. I mean, it was awful. I mean, she should have gone to California, because that way I didn't have to see her hanging out with another guy, or worse still, another guy going into her room and closing the door. And the pain of that was 10 times worse. So it's the same thing with separation anxiety. It's so much easier once mom is out, you know, and gone for several hours, you, you, most of these kids who don't have the disorder will actually rise to the occasion. And again, the idea would be to recognize the struggle and commend the struggle. You know, um, this is a hard city because everyone is very successful, it seems like. It's a very big bubble. Uh, my, my oldest son, who's 30, who's a successful guy, says he feels like he lives in a shtetl. And he says the reason for that is that you walk, for those of you who don't know, Shtetl is the pack in Russia, that little old village that uh, Tevya from Fiddler on the Roof lived in. And he says that you walk on a street here and people stop you and say, what deal are you doing? You know, and before, what school did you go to? Or what are you spending the summer at? Uh, did you get that scholarship? And I think he's exaggerating it, but you know, this is the kid who was giving eye exams to Henry Stern, so we're not sure if we could trust him. But it is that kind of bubble-like feeling, and so that you as a parent can lose your footing because everybody seems to have children that are inventing penicillin and uh, winning the Nobel Prize. I mean, you know, I, I, I raised my kids here. I can't tell you how many of those dinner parties we went to where we were in the elevator going downstairs, and I said, how did we get stuck with the average kids? You know, it's like, I don't understand statistically how this happened to us. Or, or it, literally 20, 
24 years ago, during the summertime, we had three kids. My wife was out at the beach, and uh, I was a very young child psychiatrist. I was actually the head of child psychiatry at Long Island Jewish, so I was the youngest chief in the United States, and I was sitting and having uh, uh, dinner with another summer bachelor, and in passing, he brought up somebody's name, and he said, you know, the guy's such a wuss. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, he's worked for Solomon Brothers or Lehman Brothers, uh, some brothers, for 10 years. And I said, well, he must make a lot of money. Mind you, this is 24 uh, years ago. And he said, well, Harold, at best, he makes $400,000 a year. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, he must think I make $400,000 a year. And I, 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 I mean, I work for a not-for-profit, and, you know, it's, I can't, but I'm not going to let him know, do you know what I mean? I'm just smiling, and, and obviously something twitches or something like that, and he literally says to me, well, Harold, you can't compare yourself to him. After all, you're just a physician. And I'm thinking, do you know how hard it was for me to get into medical school, just a physician? And then he says, you know, so-and-so, he works for Drexel Burnham, and he makes a million dollars a year. And you know, so-and-so, he can barely put two sentences together, and he makes two million dollars a year. And now I'm sitting at the table thinking that I either missed the day at school where they taught everyone how to make a million dollars, or someone was mean and tore the pages out of my book, and the worst part is, does everybody who I know not only make a million dollars, but do they know that I don't make a million dollars, okay? So think about this. I'm 35 years old. I'm a really successful in the top of my field, right? I've got this terrific job. I have three children, got a good marriage. We got a small house out in the Hamptons. And I'm sitting there really feeling uncomfortable. But I'm also pissed because I have a right side of the amygdala. And so when the check comes, I thought mold can grow on it before I'll pick up that check. You know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck you. You know, it's not happening. So <laughs> I'm way, he picks up the check. Check. It's I'm, I'm on Madison Avenue between 92nd and 91st Street. He get he crosses the street. He lives in that he lived in that white brick building. And now I'm walking down the street. And I'm telling you, I I feel so awful. Some people, how did I take the wrong track in life? How did I make this mistake? And walking up the street is Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. And she, does every they're not. You can't be that young that you don't know who Paul Newman is. It's a big deal, okay? And he's shorter than you would expect. He has uh, very, very blue eyes. He's got a seersucker jacket over his uh, shoulder. He's got his arm around Joanne. At the time, she had bleachy blonde hair. She looked very good. I'm too cool to say anything. I'm a New Yorker, right? Do we bother? We don't bother celebrities. They're walking up the block. I'm walking down the block, and they say, hi, how are you? And I said, fine, how are you? And she says, aren't we lucky? It's such a beautiful night. I said, yes, we're very lucky. And he says, yes, and we live in New York City. Isn't that terrific? And I said, yes, it's really great. It's good to see you. And I keep walking down the block. And instead of being excited that two of the most famous movie stars at the time think they know me, all I can think about is that each one of them is making more than a million dollars a year. <laughs> so if you can be thrown, and I'm, I'm being very honest, I was actually thrown by this, you can understand how easily you, you can be thrown when someone says, oh, but my kid got straight A's, or my kid's playing music, or my kid is reading, do you know what I mean? And especially when you don't understand normal development, so you take these, your little son to the park, and there's some little girl who's the same age saying, mommy, can I have some more peanut butter and jelly and cut the crust off? And your son's going, eh, eh, eh. And you know, you, there's no, so knowing, develop, understanding what normal development is, and also being able to accept those deficits and working on them so that in a, in a town where you can run into an Oscar winner, or you could sit at dinner with someone who's making millions of dollars who can't put two sentences together, but it becomes very important for us as parents to basically put um, an envelope or to put a neighborhood around or a home that really becomes the most important place for values. So that means that besides looking for these worries, we have to switch the picture from what's wrong with this picture, which is what's one of the you know tests on the uh, IQ, what, what's the most important piece that's missing, you know, and they show you a teapot, and it doesn't have a, um, a handle. And so when my quirky son Josh took the test, he said, there's no tea in it. And they said, but it doesn't have a handle. And he said, well, you don't need a handle unless it has tea. I mean, it was like, we thought we could kiss Hunter goodbye, but the fact is that, you know, 
we thought they were actually cool answers. But the important part is, what's good about this picture? So if I can tell you, you know, when Ned was giving you things to do, something very concrete is to start a ritual. Whether you have dinner with your family every Sunday night or you have dinner with your family every Friday night, and I want dad to be there, so just pick the day, you have to start the ritual of going around the table and saying, why, what, what happened this week that makes me happy? And you can, only one person can say, oh, I'm so happy it's Friday, or oh, I'm so happy it's Sunday and I don't have to work. But you have to go around the table and do it. And you can go around the second time and say lucky, even though I can never define the difference between lucky and happy. But it gives these, this opportunity for your children to articulate, to speak in front of their parents. If the kid is not old enough to speak, a brother or a sister can, can help out. Um, and if they feel unlucky or unhappy, it's got to be something very serious. Not making the team, not getting an A, not, um, not getting into the special class is not unhappy and unlucky. Do you mean, unlucky might be, I studied real hard, um, a lot, uh, happy could be, I studied real hard and I actually got a B. Celebrate the B. Celebrate the accomplishment of that hard work. So because the next set of disorders that we all suffer from, which is a real anxiety disorder, is generalized anxiety disorder. These are the kids who worry before the test, they worry during the test, and they worry after the test. And anxiety is good because on Thursday night you ask your mother to please go over the words for the spelling quiz on Friday. It's when that anxiety gets out of control and those kids start experiencing, by the way, stomach aches and headaches seven days a week because they get so invested in performance. So how was soccer today? Oh, I got two goals and three assists. No, but how was soccer today? Did you have fun? Did, did Bobby come? Did jo was Josh there? Did Adam show up? I got two goals and three assists. Or where am I going to go to college? You're in fifth grade. Do not enter into that discussion. Do you mean? It's kind of like they, they're pseudo precocious. They're very seductive. It's very easy to get into it. And what you don't want is to feed the monster. You don't want them to say, oh, for, you'll be OK, you'll be OK. It's what did you do to prepare? How can we help you to feel more prepared or to feel calmer about it? And the best news is there's going to be another test next week. So if it didn't come out the way you wanted, you'll have another opportunity to take the test. And in a town where we're talking about, or a city where we're talking about people being so driven by performance, it's very easy to get kids who have GAD um, to feed it and to say, oh, they're so pseudo precocious. Of course, they're talking about college and fifth grade. What we know, though, is GAD is particularly bad for the brain. When you have generalized anxiety disorder, it makes you, primes your brain, you're much more likely as a teenager to have real depression. And depression is a very serious illness. I'm not talking about demoralization. Demoralization is crummy things happen, we feel crummy. That's the human condition. Depression is real, where you uh, have appetite changes, sleep changes, concentration changes, and you feel hopeless. You are more likely to hurt yourself, particularly if you're a teenager. And so keeping our kids balanced is really the anti-GAD. In other words, saying, yes, school's important, but so is Little League, or so is hanging out where it's movie night at home, or it's reading. And the other thing, if I would tell you about, you know, one of the most important things you can do is start the reading ritual. So you have a newborn, a father, doesn't know what to do with kids to do, the few fathers in the room will vouch for me. We throw our children around. Mothers hold the baby like this, and fathers are just, you know, I, you know, we don't know what to do. Take the baby, put the baby in your arm, get a book, read Good Night Moon 25 times, read The Runaway Bunny, read pa Pat the Bunny, start the ritual of 20 minutes every day of reading to your child so that when you come home from work, dad comes home from work, you make your husbands and the fathers much better as fathers if the kid comes running to dad's arms and says, read to me. Because the reading then becomes so much, you know, just becomes a vehicle for conversation, for anything you really want, but it sets up a time where kids are just doing something which is totally good for their brain, unlike the questions that we have from screens. And the last thing we have to think about as far as um, anxiety is obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, here's an important one obsessions and compulsions are good for us. 
you know, we wash our hands before we eat. We, uh, we check that the door is locked. We uh, make sure the kid's safety seat belt is on. All of those things are good. It's when it becomes pathological, when you can't stop, when the thought is illogical and I have to wash my hands five times or six times as far as a compulsion, or the thought is something terrible, you know, my teacher hasn't showered. It's completely absurd and yet I can't get the thought out of my head. And OCD is much more common than we realize. It's 3% of the general population. It's deep in the caudate nucleus of our brain. It's a deep center. It runs in families, highly genetic. And like anything else, if you got a rash today and you wait two weeks to treat it, you're, it's going to be bloody from the fact that you've been scratching it. If you wait two years, which is the average amount of time parents wait when they see their kid doing this kind of stuff, it's so much more difficult to treat, but it's also it's contaminated their lives in so many ways. So the rule of thumb is if any of these symptoms are causing distress and dysfunction for more than two weeks, it's time to either A, pick up the phone and call the pediatrician, um, highly recommend our website, which, by the way, we don't take money from the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, I think we're the only medical facility in the United States that doesn't even let drug reps on our grounds, and we don't take money from guns, and we don't take money from tobacco or alcohol, and it's called childmind.org. It doesn't sell anything on the website. And again, check it out to see is this serious or not, and then it'll actually find a therapist for you no matter where you live. Um, but the pediatrician is a good person to talk to also about that kind of balance as to whether or not, you know, it's too much distress, it's too dysfunctional, it's too much pain. This is not one of those times your kid gets extra credit for suffering. Um, the, my last message again is, you know, time, <laughs> attention, and Catherine said it, but I, we've always talked about writing a book. The hardest word to hear, the hardest word to say is the word no. And um, the reason for that is don't say no for no reason, but being able to set limits, really great parents do two things. They show control and warmth. So that when you want an, the most independent adults come from parents who are authoritative, who know the balance between being able to say, when a kid says to you, I want, I'm 12 years old, I want to stay out tonight till 2 o'clock in the morning, a parent says, 2 o'clock in the morning, what are you talking about? Your curfew is 9 o'clock. Uh, but mom, you don't understand, your curfew is 9 o'clock, now you have 8 o'clock. You know, that's an autocrat. That's all control. That's no warmth. The authoritative parent says, why would you want to stay out to 2 o'clock? Well, a friend from Sleepaway Camp is sleeping over at Jason's house, and I'd like to go over there. Well, who else is going to be there? Who's going to bring you home at 2 o'clock? Did you do your Sunday school homework? There's going to be a lot of give and take, but both the kid and the parent know that the parent's going to make the decision based on that informational exchange. The permissive parent just gives a lot of warmth. Can I stay out to 2 o'clock? Two o'clock, it's kind of late. Well, Jason's parent, uh, Jason's having friends over from camp and his parents are gonna be there. There's gonna be a lot of give and, back, give and take, but both the parent and the child know that the answer is always gonna be yes. And the neglectful parent shows no control and no warmth so the kid can stay out till any hour because no one is there either physically or more importantly, psychologically. So what we want as parents is control and warmth. And to quote what Joanne said, is not giving you more things to do, you're already doing it. It's just modifying it. To recognize that just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean we have to do it. We do it differently at the Smiths, the Jones, the Coens, the, Mac uh, the McCarthys. We, we don't do it that way and um, it's still good, but the answer is no. Or we do something else and um, you know, a lot of hugging and kissing and a lot of communication and listening, but um, you know, Catherine told me a story last night that her daughter at one point of her life said to her when she was in her late adolescence, said, Mom, now you're gonna sit and you're gonna listen, I'm gonna do the talking. So when she told me that story, I said, how many times did you say to your child, now you're going to sit and I'm gonna, she said, I did it all the time. I locked them in the car while we were driving someplace and I knew they were captive. Well, that's great. The daughter got the message that listening to your mom and talking to your mom are both important. And you know, it's a joyous trip and you're obviously on the road. So I, I thank you for sharing time with me and um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.